So as part of this process, um, the government has partnered with Deloitte. Deloitte are uh, contributing their time and their resources and the resources of their organisation to this exercise. Um, it's part of their contribution to it as a territory business um, and obviously with a very large stake in the territory. So well, I wanted to thank the Deloitte's for doing that. Um, we've, Deloitte's have done work previously around a number of other things that have been running over the last couple of years that have helped us sort of think about the future. But just want to acknowledge the work that Deloitte's have done today and hopefully we'll do a hell of a lot more of in partnership with government. So I want to introduce Henry and I'm just going to move this out of the way um, and we'll start our, our, our discussion. Um, what we're going to do is probably talk through for um, 40 minutes, 30 minutes or so. Uh, we weren't necessarily going to take questions unless you, you are particularly, particularly uh, you know, anxious. Uh, but, um, so the idea was we'll just talk through our, the process we've been through to date um, at the end. Now, my background, my name is Luke Bowen. My background um, is not in government. I've only been in government for a couple of years. Um, I did work for a statutory authority many years ago, but more recently in, in the agricultural sector and particularly in the, the cattle industry. Um, so I'm probably coming in from a, a bit of a schizophrenic way in so far as government process, non-government process, um, industry, government, how we work together. But, and Hendry obviously is from the private sector. So what this is about is trying to find how we do this together. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a learning process for governments, a learning process for those out, out in, the, in, in industry and community. So Hendry, uh, Henry Mentz from Deloitte, so you might just want to say a couple of things before we get stuck into it. I'll just say thank you, Luke. Um, and sorry, I need to use a mic. I did go to a voice therapist a while back, but when she listened to my accent, she just said, sorry, I'm not a magician, can't help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've had a few um, with challenges with language um, out around the traps. Um, Henry, obviously, you can work out where he's from. Uh, we don't have an interpreter, so you'll just have to put up with it. I'm sorry, but the mic's the best we can do. So. We did think about that, but we just couldn't get it sorted for today. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, let me get the machinery to work. So now this is, this is a, um, a picture we've tried to create, which is this concept around how we are going to work together. So I think um, Henry is probably good to talk to this, but my perspective around government historically sometimes works. Government does things. The doors come flying open. They come out and present something and say, here you go. You know, we're here to save you, which public servants sometimes say. Um, but here it is, here's the blueprint for something or other, uh, whether it be an economic plan or whatever, but this is very different. This is about actually not coming out of the doors at all, but in fact working around the flat, making sure that we've got everybody owning the process we go through, but also the outcomes that we're looking for, the strategies across industry sectors, across community, across government, uh, and taking people through a process. So we tried to represent that in terms of, and Henry might talk to this, about people on the bank throwing rocks, uh, and, and government, it could be government in the boat rowing. But Henry, I'll just hand over to you. Look, yes, I think the Chief Minister, what he didn't say is what he told us not to deliver. So if you don't mind, Michael, I'll share that. So he said to us, I don't want a glossy document. I don't want a whole lot of consultants speaking it. And then Alf piped up and said, and I fall asleep when I see um, slideshows. So I was saying, well, what are we going to do then? Because that's what we do. And basically, the, what, what we've been tasked with is to come up with something that all territorians believe in. So what we need to come up with is something that's going to make a real difference to our economy that's implementable and can, can happen immediately. And what we've said there is what can't happen is government can't develop it, a consultant can't develop it. So if we do that, what will end up being is the people on the side throwing rocks at it. We want everybody to be in that boat together. We want everybody to work together to set up this economic plan. As Michael said earlier, this is a plan for Territorians by Territorians and it needs to go beyond the electoral cycle. What we're looking for here is how do we actually change the, not just our future but the future of our children. So broadly speaking, the process we're going through, I said it was sort of from, from October to March and we've really sort of got into the first phase of it uh, and we're reporting back effectively. Many of you are at, at meetings we held over the last four to six weeks. Um, so we're really reporting back on what we've found through that first sort of series of engagements. Um, but once, once again, October to March is where we then come back uh, collectively with, with an economic development strategy or draft economic development strategy to some summits. Uh, probably we're not, we're, we're sort of reasonably flexible, certainly Darwin, certainly uh, regional areas and, and Alice Springs, to present back a, a draft strategy which is effectively a collectively developed um, strategy or, or framework for people to ratify. Um, and obviously, you know, government will have had a good look at that as well before and obviously people who have developed it collectively will, be, will know a lot about it. But we want to go through a, a constant process. So that's a, a reasonably tight, we're working to a reasonably tight time frame. We've got a bit of Christmas in there, we've got a bit of wet season, we've got a bit of people getting stuck behind water, behind rivers, all those challenges as well. So we've obviously got to work, we've got to be pretty agile uh, and pretty focused to get this done. Um, so we're working to that, uh, achieve that end 
uh, and, and everybody's at a different stage, so we've got to manage that as well. So that's the broad uh, process we're going through. After March, of course, that is where the rubber really hits the road because a lot of this is about sitting down and working it out. After March, it's about getting on with it. Now, we also be, we've got to be very careful that there's not the perception that everything's pulled up waiting for this to happen and finish. This is, this is, this is a long-term process that is going in parallel with everything else that government is doing. No one's pulling up and, and uh, pulling up stumps for Christmas or waiting for this to happen. So this is running in parallel. So that's the other thing we need to be very clear about. So far, and many of you in the room, um, and some in the room that weren't in there, and there's some people from regional and remote areas, and Harold, Harold Wilson from down there in the uh, Land Trust, not that far away uh, from what air uh, is here. So there's a lot of people who we've got in the room who may not have also been at some of those forums. But, um, and I thank everybody for coming. Uh, he wasn't involved necessarily first up. We've been across the territory. We've talked to 114 different organisations, 252 people. And that's just a, pie gra a chart, I should say, of the locations, the number of organisations we've spoken to. Um, and, and many of you are represented here. So what we came back with, Hen oh, oh, sorry, I'm doing all the talking. Henry, um, just a quick reflection on, the, on that process we've been through so far, which is effectively the first stage, uh, which we're reporting back on now. Yep. Look, yes, the question that we've asked in that first stage was, uh, what challenges do you see for economic growth um, in the Northern Territory and what opportunities do you see for economic growth in the Northern Territory? Now, we got a whole range of answers on that, but what we, we have done is we've actually distilled that and said we can take that down to six key factors. And those are the six that's up on, on screen there. Land, people, capital, enterprise, innovation, connectivity and livability. And what we found is those factors came up in every one of the sessions that we ran to varying degrees, to varying degrees and varying industries. But, and I probably fell a little bit for the consultant speak there, Michael, but what we're saying is we're looking at those levers that we need to shift. Those, the, the, if we can shift the dial on those levers, we can enable economic growth in, in the territory. And we want to take it one step further. When we, we work out what the strategies and the actions are, it's a many-to-many -many relationship. So one strategy, one action can actually move more than one of the levers that we've developed. So what we thought we'd do is we'd actually dig down. Now these are, these are, we're going to go down to each lever in a bit more detail. Now this is effectively the question probably we're asking or some of the questions we're asking when we go back out on the ground and we start talking to industries and get, get down to the detail. But in behind each one of these, in behind each one of these is a whole range of different issues and, and, uh, and characteristics. So land is the first one. I know we talk about land, labour and capital and it's a traditional thing in economics, um, but there's a lot to it in our case. And, Henry, we, we, we've talked about this and people say, hey, hey what, what about water, for example? So, I mean, this is much more than just the land, the dirt. It, it's about whatever, everything that's attached to it. Absolutely. So the way we've defined land in this instance is all the resources, basically all the natural resources that we've got at our disposal. So that includes land, it includes water, it includes minerals. And basically what came up in the earlier sessions that we had is, um, and I think the words that was used earlier, security and certainty. And the challenges that a lot of people are experiencing is certainty and security in access to land, in access to resources. And without that, that, that security and without that surety, we're simply not getting investment at the moment. Yeah, the most obvious thing when I look at that, Henry, is the first thing I, I look at our map of the territory, and I come from the pastoral sector originally. We, they have maps which have some, some land is sort of a beige colour, some land is a green colour. 50% of the territory is Aboriginal freehold land. A unique piece of, piece of legislation that brought that in, in only of Aboriginal freehold land structure there to manage it, land council, statutory authorities. We've got the other 44% other pastoral lease with Aboriginal native title applied to it. 80% of the coastline is Aboriginal coastline, 30% of the population. So those statistics are standouts. So you'd have to say that the single biggest stakeholder group, for one of, the, you know, one of those common words that we use, stakeholder group is Aboriginal people, their land, their coastline, their enterprise, their, their, their knowledge and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely right, Luke, and the, and the one thing that we can't ignore is that that is the most important stakeholder group in terms of accessing the resources in the Northern Territory. Now, what we're looking at here is how do we actually enable our Aboriginal population to be at the table to help decide how we actually apply those resources for their benefit. We've got some very good legislation that's in place, there's structures, there's systems that's in place to work out how we use and how we consult around the use of land. And the question that we're asking is how do we enable those structures, how do we enable the processes to make sure that we can get the timely access to land, that we can get secure access to land, but most importantly that we do it in a manner that engages our entire population. All right, so look, I think um, clearly we're going to use each one of these leaders. We're going to talk through them, each one of them. There's another five to go, so I hope you're not going to sleep yet. But 
Um, but this is where we're going to go down to the detail in the specific industry, community, regional sort of meetings. We're going to start unpacking these key levers. And the second one was people. And, I, I, and we talk about Aboriginal land as just one particular case. And it's inseparable from people. Land and culture and, and sense of place is inseparable. And we know that that's, that's, uh, you know, that's a consideration in other areas as well. Absolutely, Luke. And, and when we looked at people, we found it an absolute conundrum. I mean, on the one hand, we've got businesses screaming for more people. So we need skilled people, we need semi-skilled people, we need labour. But then on the other hand, we've got a large proportion of our regional population that's not, not part of the workforce at the moment. And we've got our young people that's struggling to enter into the workforce. So it's not simply a matter to say that we need to attract people to the NT and we need to retain. It needs to go further than that. It's how do we actually empower our regional population? How do we empower our young people to be part of the workforce of the future? The, one of the things that, that, that uh, I think is emerging is that, and we have to be very aware of, Henry, is that we're talking about robots, we're talking about driverless cars, and you know, we've, we've got this, this thing going on about the um, backpack attacks at the moment. And you know, somebody said the other day, well, we won't have to worry about backpackers in 20 years because we'll be picking everything robots. Now, um, that may be, well be true, but we know that automation um, and labor, less labour systems are coming in, and they're coming in, already been coming in for a long time. So how do we then position people? These are some of the questions we need to be asking ourselves for things that we don't know a lot about yet. In regional areas, for example, uh, if we're not going to be using the same number of people in industries and all the rest of it. Exactly, Lugan. And what we need to look forward to is what are those jobs of the future? What are the industries of the future? We can't look to the past. We need to prepare our people, our young, our children, our young people to be part of that workforce of the future. I just had a, a comment from Chanel that I think we're now 13% for the backpack attacks. It's, it's a little bit like a dartboard in Canberra at the moment, so <laughs> we, we're not there yet. But what we need to look at is what's those policy decisions that actually impacts on the availability of labour in the Northern Territory. This is so critically important. We need to take it further than that. We need to make sure that we empower our own people with the right skills for the future industries. And I, I know pointing to the Chief Minister's discussion about our wider area too, so there's also a lot around labour mobility and, and, uh, and people moving in our region and, and availability of labour. So the third lever that was identified and came through very strongly, um, and probably no surprise beyond people and land, was obviously capital, and, and we've got various categories of that. Now, this is the Chief Minister referred to government spending in some cases also then unlocking the potential for private sector spending, which we know the enabling role that government can play in infrastructure spend, for example. But you've got, I think you've got a lot more on that, Henry. Absolutely, Luke, and, and this is such a critical <coughs> area. Obviously, government expenditure and, and government spend is a really big part of the Northern Territory economy, but we can't just look to government to solve our problems. We need to step back and we need to say the government expenditure and the government projects that's out there needs to be targeted in such a way that it actually enables and encourages the private sector investment. Now, um, if we look at where we're at at the moment and we do have a slowing economy and the government has responded to that, the question that we're asking as part of these series is to go one step further and to say what are those projects, what are those initiatives that's going to make a fundamental difference in every one of our industries. Now, a lot of people will say all you're going to do is bring forward projects and we're just taking that out of our future growth. Now the answer is yes, to some extent that's true. But if we do the right projects, if we do those projects that actually gives us exponential growth into the future, we can properly have our cake and eat it. We can fill some of the gap that we've got in the economy at the moment. But what we're really aiming for is for those projects that will also enable future growth. If we can get, get that, that equation right, I think we get the best of both worlds. There's a lot of focus at the moment on the North Australian Infrastructure Facility. I, I've, there's been a board meeting up here and there's been a lot of people talking about this $5 billion facility, which is, which is obviously concessional loans. Um, there's also been discussions with a lot of the fact that there's a lot of potential for money elsewhere, not just out of these, some of these facilities, but um, and how do we get the right enabling infrastructure so that some of these other sources of finance will also come in? Absolutely, Luke. And as I say, the enabling infrastructure is critical, but it's more than that. We had an interesting conversation this morning with Chris, which is um, all, or his, his entire role from a federal perspective is about drawing um, investment into the, into the north of Australia. But the question is also, how do we provide the right information to those investors, to those countries, to know what they can actually invest in? We don't need to necessarily develop the projects for them. We just need to give them the right information and tell them what we've got with the people, the resources that we have, and they will come and create the opportunities for us. Okay, so the, the, next, the next thing that seemed to be coming through very strongly in all the discussions we had uh, up front, and we were able to distill into this one, was around enterprise and innovation. And I know that uh, Tony Abbott was, was uh, on, the, on the news there a little while ago so, uh, telling the government in Canberra, you better leave that innovation thing alone, people are sick of that, too, too much, you know, wah-wah. 
Um, but I think in inevitably, if we're not keeping ahead of the game and we're not innovating, well, we're going to we're going to be snoozing and losing. So uh, this is this came through very strongly. How do we position our our industries here for the future? Exactly, Lugan. And the critical thing there is we call it enterprise and innovation because on the one hand we need businesses and we, we need businesses to grow our economy. We can't expect government to grow the economy for us. We can expect government to enable the growth, to enable, to create the environment in it and be an enabler. The private sector needs to be out there creating the businesses, being entrepreneurial and growing the economy of the future. And we're not going to do that if we don't get more businesses to actually set up in the territory and to grow their businesses right here. So it's to the benefit of all Territorians. And I think the other thing, and we've got a second slide which just makes sure we don't forget to talk about it, but let's not just think about some of the traditional areas. So we talk about a lot of industry, existing industries which are well established, well known, strong identity, but we also have a range of emerging sectors uh, which we clearly uh, are going to focus on here as well and we're going to need to think over the horizon. Exactly, Luke, and, and that's where we, we look at the innovation, and, and I know it's a word that's properly overused, but it, what we, we've put up there is tropical and desert knowledge. I mean, we've got one of the best medical research institutions in the world in tropical, <coughs> right here in Darwin, the Menzies Institute. Why can't we have more than that? I mean, we have got a first world country in a tropical area, it's not many places that got that. We've got resources, we've got skilled people, we've got a great university. We can provide a pipeline of people for those industries, but we need to think broader. We can't look to the past, we can't just look towards government. We need to create those businesses and we need to make sure that we, we prepare for what's coming. Now, connectivity, this is, this is the, sixth, uh, the fifth lever. Connectivity, and I, I, I think we often think about you know, telephones and how well our communications work, but we've, we've, we've seen this, the discussion come in quite closely around, it's not just about telecommunications, it's about our relationships. We have two, and I know for those of you that were at some of the workshops we ran uh, over the last number of weeks, we talked about two sets of relationships that the Territory has. One is a trading relationship with our region, um, you know, with, with Japan and China. It's a two-way trading relationship. We're generally on the better side of the ledger as far as the balance of, balance of payments trade. But we also have a relationship with Canberra, and 70% of our money comes, effectively comes from Canberra. So if we're really, really raw about it, um, we are very much dependent on the rest of the country uh, because 70% of our income comes in that way through redistributed GST and, and grants and whatever else. How do we, so part of this discussion is how do we turn that relationship so 30% of our income, which currently is generated by the Territory, starts to become a greater share of what we spend, what we, what we earn through our relationships, our trading relationships in the region. Our success in the future will be dependent on how we do, how well we do relationships, trading relationships in our region and beyond, of course. So this was a very strong theme uh, that came through, obviously still connected back to everything else, but. Absolutely, Luke, and, and I mean, everything tells us that world growth is going to be north of us. World growth is never going back to Europe, in any way not in our lifetimes, and it's probably not going back to the US either. It's all going to be just north of our borders. And basically when we look at the relationships we need to establish, the question that we're asking here is, can we actually be the hub for Australia? Why do we have those relationships bypass the Northern Territory? Now, when we look at connectivity, we look at it from two perspectives. There's the supply chain, there's the physical infrastructure that we need, but it's more than that. It's how do we create the relationships? How do we create trusted relationships? How do we show mutual benefit to our neighbours to the north so they will invest and they will actually become part of the success story that we've got here? Um, and the last one, this has been a really interesting one because almost without fail, uh, when we've been getting around the place, people talk about where they live, you know, they, they like to be able to go, and go fishing, they, there are all these things that people do. And a bit of work that was done um, over the last couple of years around population also pointed very heavily to the fact that people value that above, in some cases, above everything else. People come to the Territory sometimes for that reason. People often leave, but they leave for other reasons. It's not about how good it is to live here, it's because they're going off for another job or because their, their parents are getting old down in southern Australia. So livability came through very strongly. And interesting, when we've come back inside government and talked to some government people, we get very differing views. Some people say, absolutely, that is, in fact is the main objective. Others people say, oh, it's not that important. So it's a very interesting one, quite, quite probably debatable. But I mean, I have some very strong views. But it came through strongly for us, certainly, uh, as, as per that, that one single lever. Look, again, I'm a firm believer that place is absolutely critical because places where we live, places where we interact and the better people interact, the more innovative we become, the more entrepreneurial we become, the better we are led, the, the, the more we create. So we've got capital, we've got land, we've got basically the resources, but we need more than that. We need people to interact and we need that social interaction if we want to make the most of what we've, we've got at our disposal. So it is obviously critical that 
if we want to attract, we want to retain people, that the space that they live in is friendly and it's a space where they, they feel comfortable. But it's more than that. It's also about creating that, that interaction to make sure that we, we do create those businesses of the future and we do enable the businesses of the future. So um, that they were the six levers. They, that was the distillation of a lot of the, lot of the things that people were saying. Um, and that's what we want to take back out as being the things that we, we then start to unpack a bit in a bit more detail and actually start coming up with some real live strategies for government, strategies for industry groups, strategies for community, strategies across the territory, which will become part of an, a new economic framework that will be adopted and owned by, by the territory, by Territorians. Um, and we want to use those levers as to start that discussion and to make sure we are ticking off on the right things, that we're being driven by the right things, the right drivers, the right levers. So going back to our, our, uh, our picture here, um, once again, we started here in this space. We came up with those levers about here somewhere. You're sitting about here now. We're about to start a more detailed process of going out to the ground. Also, I said before, fairly tight timeframes. Admittedly, apologies that you know, we're, we're putting ourselves and others under a bit of pressure. Um, and the idea is that we will have, by the end of March, at, at a major summit, a sort of a, a bit of an economic framework that um, will re then be a bit of a blueprint for the way forward. Um, but it'll be a collective one. And so we have to, I'm a public servant now, I have to adhere to some principles around this that I think public servants aren't always necessarily comfortable with because it's, we're talking about dealing across, across, the, the, uh, across the territory. Not just, this is not just an exercise by government. Government's only very much a part of it. So it's a bit of new territory for some of us, I think, for some people. Sometimes government has an, you know, can sometimes retreat back into, no, we'll, we'll do this for you sort of thing. So this is, these are some very strong principles which have been driven by the Chief Minister. Um, and I think from our perspective, we've both, you know, we've got a, Henry runs a, a, an accounting firm, personally um, got, got a fair bit of skin in the game with it. We're very committed personally. I'm certainly committed, I'm a public servant, to doing what I can to make sure we stick to those principles, stick to those principles that we, we are using to drive this. If it, if it, if it doesn't work, I'll be the first one that needs to be shot. He'll be the, he mightn't get shot, but he won't, mightn't get any business. But I think personally, I'm very committed to this. Yeah, so I've got, I'm very committed to this, um, and I think we can do it, but we, we have to maintain those principles. And we're, it's going to be a bit of a learning along the way. Um, so I think they're, they're, that's something that's sort of me at a personal level, I can, a commitment I make. Absolutely, Lugan, and that's why we need everybody to contribute. Because so the, the critical thing here is I can't do this economic framework, Lou can't do it, government can't do it, a consultant firm can't do it. That's not what we've been tasked to do. What we've been tasked to do is to co-develop what the future of the territory is going to look like. And we need everybody's input in that, every industry, every significant group. We need every area to contribute, every region to contribute to what this future of the territory is going to look like. And when we get to the second phase, the create phase, that's where we are going to use those six levers. We're going to pose a lot of questions to people that will attend those. The question is going to be, what projects will make a significant impact? What initiatives will make a significant impact in your industry? But also, what strategies and what actions do we need? And it's critical that we say, what actions are we going to implement that will move the dial, that will get us to a position where we attract the investment, where we are confident to invest, where we create the certainty for the future.